Hi folks, um, we're very lucky to have Fort McPeepec here this afternoon, who is so good he will get two introductions, um, my very brief one, and then um, for those of you in the class, which I believe is called ICS 209S, but you know who you are, um, can you wait for about two minutes um, after the talk, and I want to talk with you about just how the, how the class works. Um, there will still be wine and drink available downstairs, believe me, and some food. Um, all right, so David. All right, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce, for the second introduction, uh, <laughs> Bookmark Pipic from the University of Zegen. And uh, it's kind of fun for me. I was telling someone earlier uh, about the story that I had lots of email exchanges with this guy, but I never met him. So I began to think uh, in the early 2000s, well, this is not a real person. It's just like an internet <laughs> identity. But then uh, around 2007, uh, we met at the end user uh, development conference. And uh, we had great conversations <coughs> since. So a couple of students got to uh, meet with him over lunch. But then at the reception, I really encourage you to pick his brains on all kinds of uh, <laughs> matters, uh, starting uh, all kinds of great matters. Uh, everything from artificial intelligence to uh, public infrastructuring, um, AI, uh, the list goes on and on. It's, it's always fun to talk to Vokmar. Uh, Vokmar's been visiting for on and off for uh, the last few months for short visits at a time. And uh, we've done some interesting projects on the Internet of Things together. And uh, I think that about covers uh, my introduction for you. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the real Vogue Market. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, welcome, everybody. Um, first of all, I should say, since many of many, maybe not many of you know the research landscape in Germany, so I'm uh, working at the University of Siegen. More specifically, we founded an iSchool there, School of Media and Information, where people have an interdisciplinary collaboration between basically applied <coughs> computer science or informatics, um, media studies and science technology studies. A very successful collaboration. We have uh, got quite a few grants and so on. And we are constantly looking for people, by the way. Um, but uh, my faculty is actually a faculty of economics. So this is why I'm also interested a lot into real world aspects of, of, of um, how you know methodologies in, in, in the <coughs> each play out for companies and for industry and so on. Um, and today's topic, I wanted to be about you know an, an, an idea that we are currently working on for quite a few years already, which we try to um, use vocabulary that we uh, got from science and technology studies in order to maybe think about new ways of organizing technology development. Uh, as a design discipline. So um, one of the main concerns that led to the interest in, into that is that um, I, I'm actually rather old in terms of when I started to uh, deal with computers. I was one of the first um, students at German high schools that were able to do their, um, uh, th their final degree <coughs> also in the, uh, on the topic of informatics. And so if I look how the world changed, then I can see that um, in the beginning of the 90s, most technology development was actually targeting professional environments, uh, which means that uh, it was kind of practical that these uh, professional environments usually have um, clearly articulated practices. They have elaborate terminologies, how they speak about their practices. And they have a great awareness about what is being done how. Which means that um, in terms of understanding as a, as, as a computer scientist what, what, what I can do for this field of practice, what kind of service I can provide, what kind of computational device I can give them, it's rather easy to come up with you know, um, a desired functionality uh, and it's kind of easy to anticipate what kind of usages there will be. The world has changed dramatically recent, uh, in the last uh, 20 years. Now there is a digital transformation everywhere which means that applications fields are not only professional ones, some uh, technologies address more private uh, or private lives, or private sector health issues, uh, sometimes even societal issues. Um, and, and the trends you can see um, around, um, around disciplines like ubiquitous computing or keywords like Internet of Things, cyber physical systems, 
In Germany, it's called Industry 4.0, by, by the way. And so what you can basically see is that there is um, a great diversification of practices that technologies could support, and the boundaries between private and professional um, uh, practices blur. There's also a dramatic increase in the amount of technology, amount in terms of the number of standards, the amount of devices, the amount, amount of um, basic technological infrastructures that we use that need to be considered in our design decisions as well in our use decisions. You can see the trend also in the way how we conceptualize um, uh, IT system development. Um, there are, I, I just, this is like a, a very historical overview about um, the waterfall models, the V models, the uh, first um, spiral models, and then later agile, this is a picture from Scrum, uh, agile software development methods. And what you can see there as a trend is that more and more attention has been spent towards um, reacting to the flexibility that practitioners require developers to have. So practitioners do not make up their mind once and then they hand you over their technological desires and then they leave you alone. No, there's always things, things going on. They're changing um, their interests and uh, as their practices, uh, and, and the practice, the framing of the practices changes. Um, so you can also see it in the emergence of other topics like user-centered design, participatory design, meaning we need to deal more with practitioners. We need to, we need to engage more, more with practices with the emergence uh, of requirements engineering, the, the handling of, of you know, the requirements that um, are the main input for the development work that you do is, is much more complex, has become much more complex. Also, trying to establish a good outcome of every uh, technology design in terms of user good usability engineering has become more important. And also, the emergence of topics like end user development, where you aim to design technologies so that um, users can kind of do the final steps of developing a technology. This is also a sign that the times, the times have changed. Um, you can also see it in the way how we model. The emergence of uh, object-oriented programming in general or emergence of domain-oriented languages like business process <coughs> management languages, they all point into the direction uh, it needs to be easier to model things from the real world and to have a good transition from the real world into the computational, in the, into the world of computational models. You can see it in the increasing demand for flexible architectures in terms of service-oriented architectures. You can see it also um, in the variety of user interfaces that are being provided at different levels of complexity um, that um, the, the um, kind of practices ha ha have changed. So in general, um, you can argue that um, there are more <coughs> arenas of co-development. So where it's not only people with development skills who are sitting together and trying to organize the development process and the development goal, but there is more interaction with practitioners going on, either at the society level when it comes to regulations that frame current efforts of, of develop, developing technologies, or at the product or platform level where um, you engage with uh, several different interactions uh, as, as a developer <coughs> with users. Um, from usability engineer about uh, over participatory design and again uh, and user development. The question is, um, even if we see that all these things emerge, is it really enough? And um, it, are we maybe mi missing also potentials of, of you know doing things even in an even better way? Now I got a call for something completely different. The guys from our spoon development unit called and uh, <laughs> asking me to make a sensitizing exercise together with you um, because you want to understand spoon users much better. <laughs> How many people of you have eaten soup once? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I would guess that quite a lot of people have also used spoons in order to eat their soup. And um, yeah, that's kind of interesting because that's actually what this unit is about. Um, however, when you have eaten soup, did you ever consider yourself a spoon user? <laughs> Maybe you didn't. <laughs> Maybe you know, your more main interest was actually yeah, tasty soup, let's eat it. And so what they tell me is it's so difficult to involve you, you, you guys into spoon design, although it's such an interesting task to, to design good spoons. 
Um, however, if I would ask you now, are you right now interested in helping design a spoon? Yeah, maybe. Okay, there's one. <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> but maybe there, are not so ma there are not so many because you have more important things to do, like attending this <coughs> lecture. Um, um, would you be doing, wanting to do that during lunch with your friends? Maybe not because you're together with your friends and you're eating soup and it's a very tasty soup. You wouldn't bother with spoon design. But what would you do if you discover that your spoon has a hole, meaning that the, all this tasty broil that is in the soup kind of escapes your taste buds? And, and, and this is an unbear, um, unbearable state. Maybe that would be frustrating <laughs> enough that you uh, would try to think about that. Um, the guys from downstairs they also told me that you're kind of strange when, when you face a spoon tech failure. <laughs> that um, you don't really want to know about how to repair a spoon, I heard. Um, and uh, instead, you, you sometimes come, even come with the idea of not using a spoon at all. You continue your practice based on <coughs> just using the fork that is available there. Um, <laughs> And what, you, what is most difficult to understand for them is you don't wait until they come up with a spoon 2.0, which finally would solve all the problems with holes in, in the spoon forever. They would not do that. Um, they also complain that you talk with each other about spoons, but they don't talk to them. Maybe that is, um, that is a common practice that whenever you encounter a, uh, um, uh, a problem with spoon technology, um, you actually would share your problem also with fellow spoon users or fellow soup lovers. Um, and um, they're also wondering how do you talk about, you know, spoons because it's, you know, such an elaborate topic to know about spoon technology and yet you, as amateurs, talk with others about spoons. So how do you do that and how do you uh, relate your, 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 your practice to the technological issues that may be at hand. And what they also notice is sometimes you're surprisingly creative. And sometimes you can really come up with ideas that they didn't think about. Um, and that currently they also don't know how to address with the spoon technologies. Um, and I mean, if, you, if I would ask you here now, um, whether you would, when you would discuss about spoons with, with fellow soup lovers, of course you would not only discuss about spoons, you would also discuss <laughs> spoon in general or maybe other aspects of uh, spoon practice. You would maybe come up with new ideas for soups, you would maybe come up with new ideas for how to use spoons. Um, and sometimes this creativity that you show even went into spoon design. Um, maybe spoon <coughs> manufacturers uh, could pick up some of the ideas or some of uh, some users may even become spoon manufacturers themselves. And then very innovative solutions come out of that. What's most unbelievable though is that uh, there are relevant practice environments that are not spoon centered at all. So there are soup lovers that don't <laughs> care about spoons at all. So, um, okay. I was trying to sensitize you for uh, the topic that is uh, how much are practitioners willing to engage with technology development? And uh, there is an obvious mismatch with the assumption that whenever you as, as developers have time, you're interested in and, and, uh, paying attention to designing the next <coughs> technology at hand, um, it may be not the case that practitioners have the same enthusiasm at that point to, de to design that. Um, nevertheless, there is an inherent relation between design and practice. Um, design things are to be used in ongoing or new practices. Um, and there is a kind of implicit dependency between a practice and the tools it uses, and also the new tools that you're going to um, develop in terms of um, uh, new uh, providing new technologies. Um, what is interesting, in particular for um, IT, is that design has separated pretty far away from practices. This, this was different, for instance, in the 50s and 60s, where many people who were using computers were actually exactly the people who were able to develop computer programs. Um, this has completely changed. Now, 
um, computing technologies more or less in, in, in each and every device, from our telephones to our washers and dryers and everything. Um, however, what is particularly excessive in, for IT tools is um, that the accessibility of the technology in terms of empowering you to handle things, to change the design of the technology is very low, while the immersiveness of the technology, the, the, the impact that it has on the practices that you, uh, that you do is rather high. And this is uh, also a kind of uh, dramatic um, issue. Um, and so you can say that basically there is a kind of expectation you have towards technology development. This is a, that you implicitly delegate your wishes about how a technology should play out. You implicitly try to delegate that um, to um, uh, designers. Um, but if you look at the way how uh, the methods that I've been introduced in the beginning, how they are working, is that if you look at how actually define, it defines the ifs, the what, the when, and the how, of design and even of participatory design is usually still on the development side. It's not that the practitioners have a big say in, 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 in deci de de deciding when, there, when, when it is time to design. You can also see that partly in the language, how whenever people in technology development talk about practitioners, they talk about users, implying that they would use technology. This is why they come up with the idea of users. Um, and if you look at the methodologies, the methodologies are all about making explicit um, how practitioners think and work. They're not very much targeting to explain to practitioners how developers think and work. So possibly you can argue that we are trying to run advisory user parliaments in development monarchies. You can also see it in the way of how um, process timelines are organized in, in, in technology development. Usually, te mo many, most technology <coughs> development methods orient uh, at an implicit timeline that starts you know, when the decision that a certain technology needs to be developed is, is being uh, taken, and it ends when the uh, product is finished. From a practitioner's point of view, there is, at some point, uh, a practice problem that is occurring that makes them interesting in, in integrating uh, maybe a new technology into their uh, practice, uh, practice environment. And then, of course, at some point there is a product, but then again the real work starts because then uh, it starts what, they, what we call appropriation, which means that they try to make sense of how to exactly use the technology in their practice. From practitioner's side, there is also a dilemma. Because on the one hand, they say they want IT, they need IT sometimes, but they also make it very clear that they don't care much about it. They want to take, don't want to take care of IT. They want it should be as easy as possible. And if information technology works, then everything is fine. But it's also not worth noting. If it doesn't work, however, hell breaks loose. And suddenly it becomes very important. So that is what, what practitioners usually do, is that they engage in active appropriation processes in order to make sense of the technologies that they um, may be able to use and try to establish um, an understanding of whether the usefulness of, the, of a technology is worth the risk that they, um, that they establish um, in becoming dependent of, the, of this technology. I did this in my PhD, looking at appropriation. What you can basically have as takeaways from that, and what inspired future research was that appropriation is always a creative activity. It is also always a collaborative activity. Even if it's only a single user application, most people turn to fellow practitioners when they have a question about how to use a certain technology or whether or not a certain technology could be useful for their practices. Um, and appropriation is also not, not, not only about functionality. It is dealing much more with the relation between the <coughs> technology and everything that a user already has and already does. And basically, it is about establishing a dependency that kind of feels OK for the user. And this is when a uh, user is finally satisfied in uh, using a technology. So what I did in the PhD already and in several other occasions is think about designing uh, of tools and functionality to support these appropriation activities. Um, but what was kind of missing is the conceptualization of the process support for the creative activities that take place. And then there was this. 
Um, I ran across a discourse. I was in, uh, introduced uh, to the discourse by Helena Karasti from University of Oulu, where I was at that time, um, that happened uh, to be in science and technology studies. About started out as dealing with uh, large technological systems where people became interested how, on the one hand, technologies are being <coughs> specifically developed in order to establish certain technological systems. On the other hand, uh, these technological systems have a, a, um, a momentum of emergence. So it's not always targeted and there's no master designer behind it. Um, but what was more striking about this article is the title. Because it was turning something that I knew before, and I was thinking about infrastructures before, but I was only thinking about infrastructure in terms of um, the technological level. Okay, there's a number of devices that are somehow interconnected and together they provide a certain service and the service is an infrastructure to me or to other services that I may then use as it become an infrastructure uh, for me. But it was uh, about a phenomenon or an entity. What the title did is, however, it changed it into something that is being done by somebody and that was kind of important. That infrastructuring is something that is not just happening, but that is something that is a phenomenon that consists of activities that you can look for and that you can actually address. Um, and the article based on <coughs> also on an earlier article from Susan Lee Starr together with Karl Rohleder from 1996, where they identified um, eight characteristics of what constitutes an infrastructure. And again, the interesting thing there is that you find certain keywords that my, may, uh, you may remember also from the brief discussion about spoon design, for instance, that uh, infrastructures are embedded in other social and technological structures, not only about the spoon, it's about the whole experience of soup eating. That infrastructures consist of taken for granted artifacts. You never thought before, before I gave you the example, you did not think about spoons. And also that um, infrastructures are normally invisible and become visible up in breakdown is a kind of a resemblance of, of um, what I did with, with the spoon example. But what is more relevant is actually, is it's not only a technological description of what an infrastructure is, it's, it's also has, addresses social aspects of infrastructures. Um, there are, uh, the aspect of uh, that infrastructure are embedded in social structures, there are, around the taken for granted ar artifacts, there are organizational arrange arrangements. And more important, you learn that as part of membership. Membership in what? Membership in a certain practice of using a certain infrastructure. Um, <coughs> infrastructures are shaped and uh, shape uh, uh, conventions of practice. And um, they are kind of influenced also by conflicting local conventions. Um, and, and all these things are actually things where humans also do something that is entirely non-technological and um, <coughs> therefore very interesting to look at. Um, all these characteristics um, resulted in an immediate use they had for doing research. That was actually whenever we do an ethnography, for instance, when we are trying to look for, to understand a practice um, and try to look for uh, interesting arenas in that practice, in arenas that are interesting enough to um, have a meaning for uh, a certain kind of technology development, we would be looking at activities that change the characteristics of this infrastructure. And, and for every characteristic, you can basically come up with um, an idea to look for a specific activity. So this is an immediate use of this uh, conceptual model of infrastructure. The value of the model of infrastructure, however, is that it kind of breaks with um, putting the activities of technologically informed designers over the activities of practitioners. All people who are contribute to an infrastructure, working infrastructure, are more or less on the same level. And this is the important message behind um, the framework. There are other science and technology concepts that are, have a good use potential. There is a whole notion and, and discussion of breakdowns. Uh, I will later come to that. Uh, the idea of uh, looking for reverse salience. Reverse <coughs> salience is something that, um, in technological terms, uh, is perfectly working fine. Uh, and, and so there is no 
um, objective reason for breaking the habit of using this part of the infrastructure. But since all the other parts of the infrastructure have advanced to a new level, this single point uh, in, in, in an infrastructure um, kind of denies you making use of the latest technological development zone. So this is what you can identify as a reverse salient. Um, you also understand the issue, uh, you, you can also use the issue of the momentum, meaning that you look for um, uh, prior technologies always because there is nothing new under the sun. This is what you learn from science and technology studies. Uh, basically, there is always a momentum in which an old technological basis has, uh, gives impulses to the development of new technological basis. And since we are more used to uh, the discussion of standards and, and, and uh, infrastructure layers, however, uh, the interesting thing about standards is that in science and technology developments, they are also discussed as conflict arenas, and the layers uh, again have um, play a huge role in understanding the specifics of the dependency between an infrastructure and a practice, because this may happen because of several layers of infrastructure that connect different uh, practices and different technologies. However, what remains to be an open issue is uh, what is a, so, uh, a suitable process description for infrastructure as a technology development uh, effort. Um, so, we try to work on one, and this is just a suggestion which had some consequences also for our work. Um, the goal would be that you try to um, see as a focal point of your interest the established usage of a certain technological infrastructure, which means this is a working, this is a moment in which you have a working dependency between a technological infrastructure and a certain use practice. What it means is that you overcome certain foci that other technology development have. It's a focus on, um, uh, for instance, on, on, on focusing on the finish, on finishing a product, or the focus, uh, focus on uh, <coughs> developing certain types of functionality. Once you're done with developing the functionalities, you're basically done. Um, the targets, uh, the, the additional things that you should consider when developing this, such a process description is you should allow for. Um, you should try to uh, uh, um, have make activities that go on in inf infrastructure to happen in an organized manner. You should try to introduce or uh, uh, to, to integrate all relevant <coughs> stakeholders. And you should always be conscious about addressing the relations that constitute the dependency of a practice from a certain technological infrastructure. And of course, um, it should also allow you to learn from improvements about doing good technological uh, development. So this is what we try to do. Um, again, we have uh, a model that has an implicit timeline, just as many other software development um, uh, 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 methods have. However, this is a different timeline, because this is not a timeline of technology developers. This is a timeline of practitioners. And so there's an ongoing <coughs> practice of using certain technologies in order to achieve certain goals. And the final point that we're interested in is the establishment <coughs> of a new technolog uh, uh, technological usage. However, <coughs> of course, um, there are <coughs> on both sides of the fence, uh, either both in the development spheres as well as in the, in the practitioner sphere, there are activities going on that you can actively look for. Um, and it makes sense to distinguish between these activities. Um, there are also different, these activities also have different levels of concreteness, um, which means that um, it's, it's diffi different whether when you have an activity that is actually um, about configuring a certain technology that it may, you can make use of it, <coughs> or whether you just in general inform yourself about how to Im increase the bandwidth uh, at the location where your company is, for instance. And then there is one very important point, and this is a point at which a practitioner is willing to pay attention to infrastructural issues. And in lack of a better, better name, we just called it in, in, a, in a publication a point of infrastructuring. Um, the point of infrastructuring is actually the moment in which an infrastructure becomes forward, for what reason uh, whatsoever. It's a moment of awareness. And it can happen on various levels. It can happen on an individual, on an organizational, even societal <coughs> level. 
but it's exactly the point where the dimensions of an infrastructure <coughs> becomes tangible for the practitioners <coughs> that depend on it, which means this is the moment in which um, practitioners pay attention. It's also the moment in which practitioners usually engage in a certain set of, uh, in, in a set of activities, so to improve the infrastructure. And it usually, these activities usually end then in a modified infrastructure and a modified use practice. Um, we developed a categorization for this um, point of infrastructuring where we try to distinguish between uh, positive and negative um, things that may have happened that may have caused this point of infrastructuring. Negative usually is uh, connected to the term breakdown, which means, of course, if the technology that I'm using does not work anymore, I will pay attention to it if it's relevant for my practice. Um, this breakdown does not even need to be a real breakdown in terms of that the technology is really not does not really does really not work anymore. No, it maybe it's only that in my perception this technology does not provide the services that I associate with this kind of technology. <coughs> now on the other hand, there are also some positive aspects, um, what we call then um, innovations, um, use innovations. So sometimes um, the technology is more or less the same, but you have just new technological options or the framing condition of your, um, of your practice changed in a way that you're required to, to rethink the way how you use the technologies at hand. So there are diff four different quadrants which you can use in order to conceptualize this moment of, uh, of the point of infrastructuring. Depending on what kind of point of infrastructure it is, you can think about several um, reactions that users would engage in that can be either your, your um, target of analysis or that can be your target of support if you want to design uh, for new technologies. So if an ac infrastructure actually breaks down, one may aim to repair it. If it's, if it's perceived as breaking down, maybe you will just need to find other technologies that help you overcoming the, the, the problem at hand. Um, and similarly, you can also think about um, uh, changing uh, <coughs> activities uh, where you engage in dealing with change framing conditions of a practice or whether you uh, change with a certain intrinsic motivation um, and uh, to, to change your dependency towards uh, a technology and therefore come up with, basically with a new infrastructure usage. And these activities can be called uh, are also kind of design work because these are creative activities and so we call them in situ design work. There is a lot of other ideas about activities involved with the framework but I stop with the framework I stop here now. Um, I would just want to make sure that if you think about okay this is how somewhat different from what you know as technology development and, and you want to locate classical technological development, <coughs> that would be actually in that sphere here. We already have a certain, uh, we call it sphere preparation and design, we already have uh, an intention of a certain usage you want to design a technology for, and you are in the, techno in the technology development sphere, um, you are doing activities, usually programming or any, any other type to uh, of works that produces a new technology in order to uh, you know, create a certain product. This is happening in here. But again, we are here, have a model here for a practitioner timeline, and um, this model focuses you now differently also on these kind of activities. So wh what we basically do is by using this as a development methodology is that we are trying to redefine define the when of design. Also the how and the who is designing, but the main point is maybe that we, um, this, we, we, we think about design uh, also as taking place in practice and not only taking place in, in technology development spheres. Um, the other important thing is that um, in that conceptualization of the process, the technology development or the in situ design um, can be initiated also by practitioners. It's not an issue for technology developers to, to say when design is. And again, the design focus is the establishment of a certain usage. Um, and also because of these um, 
spon uh, spontaneity is that you try to acknowledge that there is maybe sometimes a breakdown or just the idea of using a certain technology that's, uh, that um, is enough for designers to engage in this kind of, uh, for practitioners to engage in this kind of design work, it, it, the whole design becomes more opportunity driven. Another relevant concept that we worked with um, are resonance activities. And this is connected to the fact that this is a timeline that just, um, sorry, this is a timeline that just represented one <coughs> practice. However, if <coughs> practitioners um, observe other practitioners in using a new technology, that gives, that gives them a stimulus. So usages can travel from one practice to the next practice, and the activities that take place to provide this kind of stimuli, stimulus, these like the activities we did call resonance activities. It's basically everything when user communicate about certain use problems or certain technological options with other relevant practitioners about that. Um, so if this is a thinking, then there is a number of new ideas for method, methods you can get from that. Um, you can, uh, first of all, is it, makes, it becomes very clear that in situ design work is not only about developing something new, it's also about coping with something that went wrong in the old system. This is important to understand because these kinds of activities of coping and recovery work, they also need to be addressed and, support, uh, and supported by, by these kind of methods. Um, the other um, main impulse is that you have to think about design me methodologies outside a classical project context. Um, and the logic behind is that as we now support more and more practices with our technology, we may, may as well also think about um, supporting practitioners also in methodological senses about um, how they reconceptualize their um, dependencies from a certain technological infrastructure. Which means it can be opportunity-driven development methods based on, on to address uh, breakdowns. Um, it can be developing methods that help maintaining an overview of all the stakeholders um, um, uh, that are become involved in, in the re-establishment of a certain technology usage and um, to capture all of the creative activities there. You can also think about something like use reflection methods, which means that we can think about informing users about, um, re about, about rethinking how they use certain, in, uh, certain technologies and how they would um, um, answer um, to um, changes of the framing conditions of their practices. So in general, we have a whole vocabulary here that allows us to address the dependencies that are being <coughs> established between the technological infrastructures and a use practice. Um, I don't want to go into more detail with regard to the method methodologies, but I want to rather talk about what this means actually for research. Um, the research goal still remains to be uh, to improve the understanding, the methods, or the technologies that address exactly these dependencies between a technology, uh, between technologies and practices. And what we did is we um, developed um, a method we call design case studies as a kind of um, yeah, a more elaborated action research method where that aims or is able also to follow an opportunity driven approach, which means that whenever something goes wrong in, in, in practices that we are connected to, we are able to make a, a, at least a small design case study. Most of the research projects that we are now developing these days are also based on problems that we got from uh, practitioners in some field, um, uh, in some uh, field of application. Um, and if you think this can't be done, then uh, I mean, I also engaged in, in research in crisis management. The problem in crisis management is that you never can anticipate when a crisis will happen. <coughs> and so you, you're actually never there when, when, so, when you know, the, the real practice case kicks in. And you still have to deal with it. And in crisis management, we, we also found ways of uh, dealing with it. And the design case studies also try to establish a corpus of, of comparable studies so that you can learn 
from comparing different um, from different infrastructuring uh, efforts as well. What is maybe diff different from classical action research methods is that uh, it is really important to also consider the researchers as part of the equation, which means that in the way how a design case study should play out, it's necessary that researchers also document uh, their own ambitions in connection with the infrastructure. They're just infrastructures among other infrastructures that are currently working on um, understanding or improving a certain dependency between a technological infrastructure and um, uh, and the practice. Um, and they, it is necessary for researchers to also address the bias that they break, uh, bring into that. Uh, as a researcher, usually I can only operate based on a certain amount of funding that I get to engage uh, with a certain, a certain research field. And usually researchers also have important side goals like I don't know, I think getting a master thesis or uh, doing a PhD or something like that. All this influences the way how you <coughs> deal with the application field, um, and you need to document that if you want to do a design case study. But the main issue about design case studies is that they're trying to go for the long tail. The, 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 immer the immer immersion into practice is very important, that you try to stay there in practice for quite a long time until you have finally found out whether or not a certain dependency between um, a technology and um, a practice actually played off. Um, and what we really think <coughs> is that uh, a, a good design case study should be more than two years, but that's not always possible, so we compromise. Um, but what is also important is that um, uh, there's always a part of re research results that have to address practitioners and the interests of practitioners. And um, uh, the biggest problem actually for doing this kind of research, because I'm always saying about you know, the, the dependency between technology and practice, and we need to interact with <coughs> practitioners in different ways, this is really time consuming. And so it belongs to this concept that we actually also developed a new way of dealing with practitioners. And this is what we call a prax lab. Which means that we try to maintain an infrastructure in which we are in continuous collaboration with practitioners in several fields, so that we kind of familiarize with, with their domains, but also familiarize with their own histories. And they can also um, uh, have a more continuous relation with the university as well. Um, Prax labs um, usually try to address all concerns and, and, and all organizations who may be interested in an infrastructure effort, which means it's us as scientists, it's people from industry mostly uh, in terms of, of practitioners, but also with people who deal with policy issues. Um, the way how we do it is we try to involve and maintain constant relationships with, with, with these kind of um, organizations and individuals. We do that by uh, in establishing technological infrastructures that may be in some case a customer relationship management systems. For other practices, we develop social media platforms, or sometimes we interact with simple mailing lists. Um, the methodological approach remains user-centered, participatory design, uh, infrastructure in general. But um, the main idea is behind that, that in order to stay close to practitioners in a kind of effortless way. You need to do something about your research organization. You need to be, uh, become a partner also with the efforts that the practitioners themselves engage in. And this um, approach goes so far that we actually also try to lobby for different funding structures in order to be able to do that. So it's all about uh, creating a system, sustainable systematization of research experience, but also about creating sustainable relations with practitioners. And we do this now with several fields, actually. We have prax labs for the aging society, for social integration, for uh, IT at home, for the internet of things, for safety critical systems, and also for um, doing research on collaborative research, which means that in all of these fields, we're trying to maintain contact with practitioners. So the final part of the uh, talk, I would like to address another issue of the infrastructuring thinking. And this is the idea of um, dealing with resonance activities or supporting resonance activities. 
Resonance activities, again, are those activities that users engage in in order to either understand usages in other fields, similar fields of practice, or that they engage in order to communicate things about their own practice to other users. <coughs> Conceptually, um, this means that we have not only one point of infrastructure, but we have uh, one point of infrastructure that starts certain communications and resonance activities lead maybe to another point of infrastructuring because <coughs> practitioners in this line of practice understand that whatever these practitioners did could also make sense in their field as well. So there's a kind of cascading effect there. Um, how do the users usually do it? And we, I know that from studying uh, appropriation activities. So there are certain narratives there are, uh, that, that are being transferred. There are verbal or video descriptions of usages. There's exchange of configurations uh, based on either dig any type of digital media or file sharing platforms or even also face-to-face. -face. And in general, practitioners engage with each other that have similar activities or that share a certain technological interest. And when I connect that back to the spoon mm -hmm. um, and the idea how, how, how to, you know, <coughs> what kind of aspects of the spoon uh, allow for these kind of resonance activities. So one aspect is certainly the design of the spoon. Um, the spoon itself can become a, a, a boundary object of practitioners. So um, it communicates certain usage possibilities through its form. There's usually a handle and like a bowl-like end of it. Um, and uh, these forms and parts, visible forms and parts, also create the language in which users can, um, uh, can com communicate about spoon usages. And this means that you can influence this language by providing well distinguishable parts of spoon technology or information technology to users so that it becomes easier for them to communicate about it. And what is the possibility because we are talking about information technology, you can actually enhance all the things, and this is what Internet of Things currently does. You can enhance the things so that you um, uh, allow users to communicate directly using these things. And we, as an example, uh, I, we, we did that with 3D printers, uh, trying to make 3D printers uh, more, more sociable and the general practice, uh, the general strategy there wa was that we were thinking about <coughs> adding new sensors and new actuators to classical 3D printers so that it be would become easier to discuss about this, about the use of them. Um, and this is what we actually did, is we tried to provide certain articulation uh, support so that users could articulate either about technological issues or about practice issues. We would uh, treat them as more or less one community or allow them to connect to other relevant communities. And we, uh, the main strategy was to provide appropriate communication channels uh, so that they can do it. The reason why this is um, uh, a problem is uh, uh, well, an issue of technological progress because 3D printers now have become uh, so small that it's possible uh, to use them at, at home as well. The way how we tried to address this, we were thinking about three different dimensions. The one dimension is that every technology needs to be able to allow users to express things and to know and express things about uh, <coughs> internal aspects. With 3D printers, relevant things are, for instance, the temperature of the plate on which things are printed. Or uh, relevant things are the air movement that is, in the, uh, the, that is in the room. But this is not an internal thing that is external to the, um, uh, to, to the printer. Um, this is why we also thought about uh, adding sensors t that would cap try to capture the social material context that is actually also the room situation there, uh, external temperature, uh, uh, air movement and other things and um, the third dimension that we were addressing is the task or process context the result of the 3D printing process is not only uh, dependent on the 3D printer itself and its kind of physical environment it's also the question what kind of software you've been used, using in order to model a certain thing or uh, what kind of software you've been using to translate the model into um, uh, into uh, steering commandos for, for the 3D printer. There is also, in post-processing, after you have printed something, 
there are also the, there's also a chance that technologies are involved there. And this is more or less the task or process context that we need to address. All these issues may be relevant in order to describe a certain use or usage of a, of a 3D printer, whether it was successful or not, or it would be also relevant to describe a certain breakdown of, uh, of a printing process. And the idea is to integrate these additional sensors and also visualizations uh, where the uh, 3D printing process is visualized in ways that it allows you to either communicate about it um, as well as the historical aspects, which means that a complete uh, print history can be communicated. Uh, that uh, Sometimes you can even think about integrating in situ recommendations about what to do when a certain printing process <coughs> goes wrong. And there is a social network component. As I said, with social technologies, we try to connect users also directly via the device um, with each other. So this is the architecture that we that that resulted. There is uh, we added uh, we added an Arduino board and additional sensors like the web webcam and other sensors uh, that were integrated into the printer, uh, so that it becomes easier to to document and and communicate the internal aspects of um, of the printing process. You can see that here there is the Arduino board. I apologize for the blur thing here, and there is a camera with which you are able to uh, watch the printing process. Um, <coughs> then, of course, you would also capture and try to visualize all aspects that are relevant and specific about this 3D printer that uh, uh, people currently use. Um, and, and all these things are, are, should not only be captured, you should also be uh, allowed to communicate that to other users. This is a dashboard that allows you to um, immediately understand you know, what kind of other things um, have happened, maybe also to other users and not only to your printer. Um, we can understand what is going on with the printer. And then there is the idea of um, uh, commenting the print process and sharing um, uh, and, and sharing the results of, of the technology or the problematic aspect of the technology usage. And this can be done in this concept either with a Facebook-like uh, <coughs> software, but there is also a link where you can actually tweet certain results. This can be extended. Uh, this is a more recent prototype where we thought about, well, how, how about using um, the device itself as a projection surface for, for uh, you know, basically all kinds of usage, usage an annotations. And so this is what we did, that we, uh, this is a construction which we have a, a rather open model of a 3D printer. There's a projector fr from, from above, being able to highlight certain aspects of the machi machinery that play a certain role in use at the moment, and um, that allow you in this example to better understand the workings of the technology, but the basic technology that we develop is actually targeting also user-user communication so that other users can immediately com uh, comment and actually um, uh, visualize things about uh, your current 3D printer usage also on the device. <coughs> I'm already done, yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I should uh, uh, mention that is also kind of a consequence of this infrastructuring um, idea is uh, to rethink what end-user development can do. Again, end-user development had uh, always a task to establish a gentle slope of complexity for end-users so that they can have, uh, so that um, you would provide several interfaces of several, at several levels of complexity that would allow users to remodel or uh, configure the technologies that they work with. So it's a kind of uh, approach to support an incremental familiar familiarization of technology development issues. And uh, in infrastructure and thinking, um, I think end user development can also play a, a good role. It's just necessary to think about end user development beyond one single device or one single technology. And I think with regard to IoT, we're anyway going to, uh, or entering a world in which 
uh, we don't live in front of the interfaces anymore. We live in the interfaces anymore. And that means that some of the interactions that configure our technology are actually con uh, interactions that we are not even aware of. By entering a room, you may reconfigure, I don't know, a certain type of home IT. And, and we may not be able, to, we, we, may, we, we may not, not be informed about it, and we may not be able to understand it very well. Okay, so as a summary, um, yes, they do take information technology for granted. And um, I think that's an impulse where we can think about changing uh, habits of technology development. Uh, since that as technologies penetrate more practices, also in deeper ways, maybe our message should also follow that. I try to suggest now a sphere of methods and technologies that are actually targeting the dependencies between a technology and the practices, and not so much just about developing new functionality. Um, and I made use of discourses from science and technology studies uh, that provided actually a great uh, inspiration. Uh, we suggested a process model um, around points of infrastructuring, in to design work, <coughs> the establishment of usage and resonance activities, and I tried to outline the consequences that the use of such a model would have not only for your methods that we use, but also for the whole organization of research that we need to engage with. In the end, I was trying to give some examples about supporting resonance activities with social, sociable technologies, where the ultimate goal is not to think about an internet of things, but to think about an internet of things we use. And both things are important. We, as in we all, but also use, as in uh, practitioners that we all are in this kind of technology. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. <coughs> um, I was struck, there's that sort of, um, and go, sort of going back to your, the sort of model you were developing at the beginning and sort of thinking about the nature of a relationship as we sort of like develop mm -hmm. and use. It's a highly sort of structured model you presented, in mm -hmm. which these are sort of right, um, and and I wonder how much of that comes from the word breakdown, right? So I think a lot of discussions about about um, end user development and and sort of top and, and technology evolution breakdown signals something drastic, right? Mm -hmm. It signals a point where you can't proceed, yep. and so something must ra now radically change. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> as opposed to a sort of more phenomenological use of the term breakdown in which like all sorts of subtle adjustments of, mm -hmm. of, of the relation between the human and the technology, mm -hmm. including like, you know, moving my hands when I'm turning the steering wheel of mm -hmm. my car and things like that. Those are breakdown and attune us to reconfigurations of a much mm -hmm. less drastic sort that allow us perhaps to think less in a less structured manner about a, a domain of design and technology development and a domain of use. Mm -hmm. So how do we sort of think about those more fluidly? Well, the whole impulse for uh, trying to address this is actually the feeling that, on the one hand, um, the software development methods that we usually use or teach, they are also very structured, but they are structured like, like in, in a way that they ignore certain things. and, and on the other hand, um, I mean, I, 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 you, know, I, you know that I engage also with participatory design. There is a huge influence in participatory design that actually refuses to understand participatory design as a method. They, they think of it as a practice and not as a method, which kind of denies you uh, introducing a more structured thinking about it. The problem is, however, um, that I became structured because I want to systemize certain things. I, I want to be able to um, be uh, to, to distinguish, you know, good infrastructure from bad infrastructure. In order to do that, I need to develop a language that provides a systematization of certain aspects that address this dependency. For me, actually, from from my background, the notion of breakdown is not so drastic. It, I would more think about it as uh, in this more phenomenological thing that you described. And I was kind of hoping that um, I was addressing that by saying that, you know, it's not even a real <coughs> breakdown. It, it can only always be also a perceived breakdown. A perceived breakdown can also mean that um, in some kind of real situation, you just need to 
think about using the same technology in a different <coughs> way and then maybe it will provide you the services as that you want to. So, so that, that's the idea of breakdown that I would use in that scenario. Thanks. Yeah, sure. yeah I mean, um, first of all, thank you. That was a great talk. Um, secondly, a question which is, I think, sort of related to pools is probably just another, um, another way of stating pools. When you talk about the, you know, the when of infrastructuring, you know, mm -hmm. the point of infrastructuring, I mean, I've always sort of infrastructuring as a continued engagement. I mean, mm -hmm. It's not something which is just, we decide at this point mm -hmm. that we have achieved the design <coughs> goal of infrastructuring. I mean, my goal has always been to get engaged with communities in such a way that we become part of the communities. Mm -hmm. um, so could you talk about the, the temporality of it? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in my perception, there is actually a point in which a practitioner decides to pay attention to infrastructural aspects. And okay. this, this is actually, this is really a point. And, and I was trying to make this a little bit more loose in saying that um, I, I don't describe it as happening on an indiv individual level, on, on a group level, on an organization level, or on a societal level. Mm -hmm. On any of these levels, there is something happening, a moment of awareness in which either an individual or a group of individuals decides, okay, this is not urgent enough or interesting enough that I'm going to pay attention for it. Right. Mm -hmm. And since the, 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 the problem that I see, also with my personal experience uh, with participatory design, I was actually standing in front of uh, a group of worker representatives being a very motivated participatory designer and trying to explain to them, look, the technology that we're currently discussing with your management will seriously affect the information visibilities <coughs> in your fields of, field of practice. And I now want to inform you about things that I would like to do in order to, you know, that, that, that you can have a say in that. Yeah. They couldn't care less. Because the more urgent things at that time were actual contractual issues, you know, this was, a, a, a part of, of, of the company that was organized with a lot of freelancers and they were trying to get more freelancers into a union protected environment. So these were the real issues to that. And, and, and this is something that was really striking to me. You stand there, as an engaged participatory designer, you stand there and, and, and you want to participate them, but they don't want you. And this makes you aware that uh, actually the, the thinking about at which moment a uh, practitioner may be interested in <coughs> thinking about the tools and the infrastructures that he or she is being using is much more relevant than you, you thought initially. The one of the first um, prototypes you could say that we did uh, was actually developed by Gunnar Stevens, who was developing um, a help system that could be enhanced with domain or, or local help descriptions um, that would be initiated by pressing the F1 key. So the moment of breakdown was pressing the F1 key because that seemed to be exactly the point <laughs> in infrastructure when um, the user was willing to pay attention uh, to the technology that he has been using. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah. Um, so you seem to be speaking about kind of three distinct groups a lot, users, practitioners, and IT mm -hmm. professionals. But I think there is, I'd like to hear a little bit more about like kind of the difference you see between users and practitioners, as well as what happens when there's overlap between practitioners and IT professionals. In the very first article that I wrote about that in the year of 2006 to a minor uh, AS conference in, in the Mediterranean, I tried to only work with the term infrastructure. So, so all of it would, would be the infrastructure because yeah. the idea of the whole infrastructure in the framework is actually to create this level playing field between designers and, and practitioners and so on. And the problem is it's really hard to break with, first of all, with the habit of mentioning users at all. It's, if you use infrastructure, nobody will understand what, or how, no, how do you come up with that. Um, and so there's, there is actually no strong distinction between practitioner and users. But when I was really thinking about it, I would usually consciously only address them as practitioners. Because behind the term user, I, I assume always uh, the, the hidden assumption of designers that they would actually be using the technology, which is, according to my experience, is also not true. Not, not just because the technology is there, people start using it. And so 
maybe still somehow relevant for the practice, but they refuse to use it. Instead, they uh, even engage in very complicated scenarios in which they make colleagues using this technology, so just so that they don't have to use it. Yeah. I, I encountered all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and um, <coughs> maybe I should be, again, revise the, the, the talk in terms of more cautious use of, of, of user versus practitioner. That's true. Oh, there's another question. Yeah? Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, one thing, I guess, that I wanted to pick up on sort of was this discussion of the appropriation of the use of tech. Um, and I'm wondering whether you've used sort of your research methodologies to focus on appropriation in sort of more niche contexts like piracy communities, jailbreaking communities, hacker communities, modders, things like that, where sort of getting back to what Jeff was saying, like those, <coughs> those practitioners, I think, will almost always be much more engaged they're always sort of hyper-engaged rather than there being a moment. Yeah. There's For every technology, it seems like there's a group of people who, as long as it exists, they're invested in taking it. And you know, so the person who takes the fork and sticks it into a piece of plastic to make a pseudo spoon, or the person yeah. who etches out you know, little tines in the spoon to make a spork before they DRM the shape of the spoon, or something like that. Well, during the talk, I've been always trying to address it. I'm talking about methods, methodology, and things like that. Um, because one of the issues that um, make it difficult to explain is that actually there are all kind of niche of, of practices where you find incredible things going on that you, you, you cannot possibly capture by means of, of, of a method. And, and, um, I even try to be very considerate about, for instance, criti cr my critique about participatory design because also people in participatory design um, sometimes, you know, every instance of a participatory design process, or at least the ones that have been published, they are actually good, it's good, good research or good infrastructure and practice in, in, in some cases. Nevertheless, um, the way how people try to frame these practices into <coughs> methodologies, this is the, 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 the point where it becomes difficult. And um, this is maybe also more towards the Paul's comment about being too structured. It, it has to do with the ambition that I try to compete actually with software development methods <coughs> and I try to do something more practitioner related on the same abstraction level, the same level of, of generalization. And um, being well aware that, you know, in practice, lots of more things are going on and maybe even better things are going on. But in order to, you know, be able to discuss in a scholar discourse about things, you need to have this kind of methodological understanding. Uh, and also in order to teach good or bad infrastructure to people, I think it's good to have a systematic approach that usually requires to have something like a method. All right. Uh, sorry, that was the last question. However, um, there is a usual reception, and for the new people, there is a reception uh, <coughs> after the Friday talk on the fifth floor. Uh, but if you're in the formal class, or remember for a few minutes, uh, Jeff wants to speak to you. Uh, I see these two front rows are empty, so <laughs> maybe the students uh, in that class could move over to uh, that side for Jeff to speak. And then uh, we can all catch up later on the fifth floor. And thank uh, Phil Kmart one more time. <laughs>